And now a message from our kind sponsor. What? We didn't have one. What? How we meant? Starting off the news this week, the Global Commission of Adaptation have announced the findings of an analysis that looks into measures that can be made for the human race to adapt to climate change. The report estimates that $1.8 trillion needs to be spent over the next decade on these measures, but this could save the world $7 trillion in the long term. It sets out five main things that need to be invested in during this time, these being warning systems for habitation vulnerable to flooding and exceedingly high tides, infrastructure which would better suit the changing climate, the improvement of dryland agriculture to help prevent hunger, restoring and protecting mangroves underwater to protect against coastal flooding, and providing adequate water supplies to people around the world. These plans will likely see further development at the UN Climate Summit later this month. In other news, we look once again to the past, as scientists have discovered the earliest clear evidence of milk consumption in humans from a jaw around 6,000 years old. It is believed that at this time humans were lactose intolerant, leading the scientists involved in this discovery to suggest that either a very small amount of milk was being consumed or, more likely, it was being consumed in the form of cheese or yoghurt. The evidence of milk came from plaque on the teeth of prehistoric British farmers. We're moving far from Earth now as water has been discovered for the first time on a planet orbiting in the habitable or Goldilocks zone of another star. The planet, K218b, is one that astronomers think has the potential to hold alien life, and they hope that space telescope technology will be able to determine other gases in K218b's atmosphere that may be produced by living organisms. This is certainly an exciting discovery in the continued search for life outside our solar system. In the world of paleontology this week, the fascinating discovery of another severe mass extinction has been reported. Until now, it was thought that there had been five major mass extinctions in the Earth's past. One at the end of the Ordovician, one towards the end of the Devonian, the infamous Great Dying at the end of the Permian, one at the end of the Triassic, and the end Cretaceous extinction that wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs. However, occurring at the same time flood basalts in northern China were produced by huge volcanic eruptions, it seems another mass extinction took place, also in the Permian period, around 259.8 million years ago. The researchers say that the extinction ranks alongside the others in terms of the ecological impact and the number of genera dying off and there were notable shifts in various communities of organisms, for example, the replacement of different aminoids. So basically, the Permian was not a fun time to be alive. There's been more mass extinction news this week too, this time focusing on the most famous one, the KPG extinction, which killed the non-avian dinosaurs. Using sediments obtained from a 130 metre section of rock that was drilled from the remnants of the asteroid impact crater in the Gulf of Mexico, researchers have been able to work out what was happening on what they're calling the first day of the Cenozoic. Within the first few minutes of the impact, a ring of hills was formed from the basement rocks, which were then quickly covered over by about 40 metres of melted and fragmented rock. This was followed by ocean waters flooding into the crater within the first hour, deposing more fragmented rock, about 90 metres of it this time. Then, within the first day, massive tsunamis returned to the crater, bringing materials from far away shorelines, including a lot of charcoal, which is evidence of the huge fires on land caused by the impact. There was also a strange lack of sulphur-containing rocks and minerals at the site of the impact, supporting the idea that sulphate aerosols were ejected into the atmosphere, resulting in global cooling, and also due to the great fires, a period of darkness fell across the world. Also this week, we welcome a brand new genus and species of hadrosaur. Named Camuisaurus japonicus, this animal lived around 71 million years ago during the late Cretaceous, and is actually represented by one of the most complete fossils ever found in Japan. 
The dinosaur probably had a small crest on its head, and it has been classified as a hadrosaurine, specifically within Edmontosaurini, being placed in a grouping with Lyangosaurus from China and Kerberosaurus from Russia. And finally, some very exciting news this week as a brand new Asdarkid pterosaur has been named. The reptile is called Cryodracon Boreas, which means the cold dragon of the north winds. Although apparently Viserion was also at one point considered for the species name after the dragon in Game of Thrones. This Asdarkid comes from the late Cretaceous Age rocks in Alberta, Canada, and although it's actually been known since the 70s that these pterosaurs were present there, until now much of the material had been assigned to the Quetzalcoatlus genus. However, in this new paper, it was found that some of the already known material, in addition to previously undocumented specimens, have a distinct enough anatomy that a new taxon can be created. Cryodracon had a wingspan of at least 16 feet, or almost 5 meters, but potentially, based on other bones that may or may not belong to the species, could have grown to a wingspan as large as 30 feet, or over 9 meters, so this animal was definitely in the large size range of the other giant Asdarkids. It's always a good time when new Asdarkid discoveries are made. Thank you very much for listening to this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed it, and feel free to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have, we'll see you on Sunday.